Hi, welcome to what we are calling Classic Bookmark. When we started shooting these interviews in the spring of 1988, we had no idea the show would go on for 30 years with over 400 episodes. To celebrate and mark this achievement, we have selected 15 shows. Choosing was difficult. Most of the writers chosen, like Horton Foote and Ray Bradbury, are deceased. Others, like Toni Morrison, the Nobel Prize winner, are perfectly well, but I do not think we will be lucky enough to have them on the show again. We purposely did not include some bookmark favorites like Rick Bragg, Winston Groom, Cena Jeter Naslund, Brad Watson, Daniel Wallace, Michelle Richmond, and others, since we plan to visit with them regularly in the future. Viewers will notice that the technology has improved considerably in 30 years. We have cleaned these up the best we could. These first 30 years have been a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy watching these as much as I did making them. Gay Talese has been hailed as the inventor of the new journalism, the blend of fictional technique with intense, accurate reporting, and is the author of a dozen books of nonfiction, including the memoir, A Writer's Life. Sport has always held a fascination for Talese. He began his career as a sports writer, and his most recent book is The Silent Season of a Hero, a collection of his stories over seven decades, mainly on boxing and baseball. I spoke with Gay Talese at the Alabama Southern Community College in Monroeville, Alabama. Mr. Talese, it's nice to see you again. I share that. We, we've done this a couple of times, <clears throat> and it's always been a pleasure. I feel as if I'm keeping up with, with an old friend. It's like, uh, indeed, it is that. It's a reunion of people who, in your case, have been at the University of Alabama, and your position as a, as a, as a, as a professor, as a, as a fellow writer, and me as a visitor who had fond memories of my youth there. I was yeah. 17, 21. I, I went to Alabama in 1949 as a freshman. Yeah. And even though I left in 53, I frequently went back. And I actually went back as a reporter. I, I was with the New York Times from 1956 uh, to 65. And uh, one of my last stories as a New York Times reporter was to come to Tuscaloosa and interview the first African-American graduate, Vivian Malone. I wrote that for the Times. I also did a lot of um, reporting on the civil rights movement in Alabama. Well, this visit is special. You're not working. You're here to be honored. You have That's won right. the, the best prize in the state of Alabama, the Harper Lee Award for Distinguished Writing. In your case, distinguished, what we're calling yeah. uh, nonfiction or creative nonfiction. Sure. Um, I'm very glad to this, have this. How award. about that Harper Lee Award? <clears throat> I'm very honored, of course. Who wouldn't be? Uh, only more so if, if I was able to meet her. Now, uh, Rick Bragg, who won this previous years, <laughs> yeah. a colleague of the New York Times as well, yeah. uh, told us uh, during a uh, part of this se seminar. He spoke one evening at dinner, and he mentioned his his um, <laughs> having met. The grand lady herself. Yeah, yeah. But we also um, don't have to meet her because we, through her work, we know her, and through the through the relationship with Capote, we even know her, her something about her movie because the because the documentaries on on Capote include her. I, I, uh, <clears throat> that the the prize is awarded to a writer with strong Alabama connections, and as you said, you have them. Not only the four years of school, but no, but true. repeated repeated visits. You and I share an odd uh, biographical um, uh, experience. There's, you are from Ocean City, New Jersey. I went to PS number nine in Yonkers <laughs> for a long time. I never saw Alabama before I came, before I moved here. But I had notions about what Alabama and the Deep South would be like before you came in 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 uh, forty nine. What Southern literature then had you read? Not To Kill a Mockingbird, because it was 60. 
before it came out. What what were you, what were your oh, images? Of, Faulkner was around. Right. What were your images of the South before you ever really lived in the South? I can tell you exactly. Uh, you mentioned uh, the town where I was born. You said Ocean City. Most people don't know where that is. It's near Atlantic City. Right. It's on the southern shore of New Jersey. Yeah. And it was a town founded by Methodist ministers. You mentioned New York area. I, I have no connection with New York at all. In fact, my connection to New Jersey is rather remote because the tip of New Jersey is where I was born, on the, the close to the Delaware River, below the Mason-Dixon line. And the town of Ocean City, New Jersey, as I said, founded by Methodist ministers in the late 1800s, was a highly restrictive moral town, all, albeit it was on the beach and people went swimming. But when I was growing up, men could not appear on the beach bare-chested. They had to cover up. I mean, when you're walking, going into the water, you had to cover up. The little jersey. Mm -hmm. They had a sign on the beach, no uh, bare, 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 bare uh, chest. You couldn't drink, and you still, it's, it's, a, dry, it's a dry town, uh, New Jersey. Moreover, when I was a boy, I was born in 1932. And when I was growing up in the late 1930s and the early 1940s, we had a clan. There was a KKK in my town. And my father, who went to that town as a tailor in 1920, I was born in 1932, so he was a bachelor for quite a while. He didn't get married in 1929. But um, he told me that they would burn crosses. It's is Ocean City, New Jersey. Yeah. On the yeah. beach and on the boardwalk, the clan would march. So one doesn't uh, associate the North with what is the most awful association with the South of that time. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the 1930s and early 40s before the war. And so when I came to Alabama, there was nothing, even in the racist period, that I hadn't seen in my hometown. When I was a boy going to the movies, there was only in the wintertime, it was a summer resort, but in the wintertime, there was one film house that was kept open on the boardwalk. And as a boy, with my fellow students, there would be up in the balcony was where the black people saw the movie. And we, and even though I was Italian, I was considered white, that's almost marginal. And, and uh, I'm telling you, so there's nothing. Yeah. In George we, Wallace's Alabama, which I later would be yeah. associated with as a reporter, and before that, in my student days at the University of Alabama, there was nothing about racism that I myself in my hometown in New Jersey hadn't personally seen. So there wasn't much of a difference. Less. And actually my town is rather like a, like <laughs> almost a little, like, like a small version of Tuscaloosa in the sense of the midtown, the shopping district. Well, that, that is, I think that's going to be surprising to a lot of people that the shock for you to, <laughs> from New Jersey to Alabama was not as great as people would imagine. Hardly noticeable. Yeah. Uh, and the thing about Alabama, on the more positive side, because we stress the negative here, Alabama, for me, was a rebirth. I was a student of no consequence in my yeah. grade school and high school years in this New Jersey town I mentioned. And I was unable to be accepted in the I applied to Rutgers, in, which is in New Jersey, and the University of Pennsylvania, which is not too far away from where I live. In Philadelphia, it's only 60 miles away from Ocean City. Un, 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 unacceptable. I could, my grades weren't that great. And um, only because my father, I mentioned he was a tailor, happened to have a customer who was born in Birmingham, Dr. Aldrich J. Crow was a client of my father's as, as, as it had suits made. He was a physician who came to Ocean City in the Depression. He was the most prominent doctor in our town. And um, because my father made clothes for him, knew him, when I was turned down by Rutgers and a few other colleges, my father said, it's a shame, I'd love to have Gay go to college. My father hadn't gone to college, as you could imagine. And Dr. Crow said, well, I can get him into Alabama. And I hadn't heard of Alabama. My father hadn't heard of Alabama. But Dr. Crow certainly knew about Alabama, being a son of the city. And he uh, pulled the strings and got me in. And that was in 1949, and I came here in September of 49. Well, it worked. The, 
whatever it was they taught you in those four years that has done you I'll tell you what they taught me very me. well. What they taught me was that I could be me. Uh-huh. I was very much um, uh, uh, almost ashamed of my lack of, of academic uh, progress as a student in high school and before that. I liked journalism. In fact, I wrote for the weekly newspaper. Mm-hmm. They didn't give me school grades for that, but that's one thing I did achieve in terms of achieving something. When I came to Alabama, I just came by train. I left Philadelphia and went all through the South and down through Tennessee and Georgia and finally stopped at Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Didn't know anybody. Got a bus, a jitney, took me to this where the freshman dorm was. And during that time, the freshman dorm was off the campus. It was a little backyard area in the, some of the swamplands because there's so many GIs in college then, still left over from World sure. War II. Housing was a major problem. And the freshmen lived in barracks. They looked like military barracks. They were. You, they had you, been. Were they, were they there when you were there? <laughs> they, I was there, no, when, they they were, I was there when they were destroyed, yes. Oh, finally. no, I lived in them. Uh, yeah. And... Um, and um, a lot of GIs were still in college then. Sure. And what was noticeable about these students who were GIs, they had late night card games in those barracks. It was like, for them, it was still military life, though they, many of them graduated and did well. I didn't do very well in Alabama either. Don't think I was a star on the, on the, on the scholastic level, but I did work for the Crimson White. Right. And I, in my last two years, I was the sports editor of the paper and also a columnist on the paper and also I would sometimes go with the Alabama football team big games and serve as a spotter for the national announcers at, at Legion Field in Birmingham which is where the big games were. Denny Stadium when I was there was a small place it was right. a little third rate stadium now of course it's we all know what it is now but I'd go to Birmingham and sometimes to Nashville and sometimes elsewhere Mobile first game I saw was Mobile uh, and Mobile Stadium was, was Alabama and LSU. No, Alabama and Tulane. It was Tulane. And there was a national sponsor, I think NBC, and, and they needed somebody who knew the players. And I certainly knew the players. I knew the number and I knew the history of every number in terms of Bobby Marlowe or, or Ed Salem. Ed Salem was the, El, the quarterback in those days. Alabama wasn't a good team then. I mean, this was not even, this was the, the before Bear Bryant. The coach of the Alabama team, interestingly, since we're both from the North, was from New England. And um, he was an unsuccessful coach. Oh, and Alabama didn't have any of the pride it had early, in earlier years and would have in the Bryant era, which was about five, three or four years in the right. future. But Alabama gave me a chance to start life all over. I was 17 and then 18 and 19, and I was at columnist on the newspaper, I had a little distinction there, and I met a beautiful girl from Gunnersville uh, in, my, in my late sophomore year. So I had a beautiful girl, you know, on Bell of the South, and I had a column, and it was the first time I was successful. Life was good. <laughs> I want, Never been so good since. I want to ask you a, a, a kind of craft question, very different. And this is a, you know, sometimes I ask questions to which I already know the answer, and Sometimes I ask questions to which I don't really want to know the answer, but this one is, a, this is the most bona fide question of the day. I've been reading, I, your nonfiction technique is pretty famous. Correct me here, you, you want the facts and you name the names, and you want it, it's accurate, the best you can make it. That, that's true. That, that's fair. You don't write it if you can't put in everybody's name. That's and right. Do it right. I don't want to leave any mystery there. All right. I've been reading <clears throat> novels lately, The Paris Wife and Z. And one is a fictionalization of, obviously, Hadley, Ernest's first wife, and the other is a fictionalization of the life of Zelda Fitzgerald. And they go, they go under the name novel, but, <clears throat> uh, and therefore you would imagine it's made up, but all the names are real, and there are things in the books that never happened, and scenes imagined that might have happened or might not have happened. I have a response to this. Do you? What I'm do you think negative. about that? I have a negative. I don't know what yours is. I don't look favorably upon that, and I don't, with any enthusiasm, read such books. Right. 
if I want to read about Zelda Fitzgerald, I want to go to the biographers who've right. done some work. Now, right. maybe they didn't do much work because maybe there wasn't much that was known about her. If there's not much known about, we'll just took Zelda, for example, uh, then don't do it. Either you do it or you don't do it. I, I feel, I mean, you, you just mentioned two books. There are numerous books that right. do this. Even, yes. even Ragtime, E.L. Doctorow's novel you might have yeah. read, sure. has <clears throat> living characters. One is Henry Ford, and right. the banker J.P. Morgan is in right. there. And what these books tend to do, as uh, these fiction books tend to do, is draw on what is familiar in history, or what is familiar about famous people of history, Henry Ford, for example, or Zelda Fitzgerald, for example, and they embellish. And now, I wish they would do that as nonfiction writers. I mean, many fine fiction right. writers right. are also fine nonfiction writers. Let's take Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal is both. Norman Mailer. Norman Mailer won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. Absolutely. And, um, and many writers, including Hemingway, Movable Feast is, 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 is nonfiction. But, but you can be a good reporter and you can be a good novelist. One of the fine novelists that has always been a, I've been a fan of is Graham Greene. Now, he's a fiction writer, but he draws heavily from his research. And if it's in there, and Philip Roth, a contemporary of mine, Philip Roth's work, while it's fiction, it is always fiction, but it is accurate when he describes something historical. It might be uh, an event during during the Depression or might be going or World War Two or, or a prize fight that he wants to right. have in in the, in, the, in the American pastorals, for example. It's all exactly exactly out of the historical records. So I don't like to be confused. I believe there is a right. very strong difference between fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. You can be creative, however, in both nonfiction. Absolutely. And and in nonfiction, how can you be creative without manipulating, without falsifying, exaggerating? You can do it with research. Take a long time. Get to know your people very well. Look at Robert Caro. Robert Caro surely knows right. LBJ like no, but like LBJ. <laughs> From the know. inside. But you read Caro <laughs> or Edmund Morris on Theodore Roosevelt. These yes. are two historians of top rank, but they're excellent writers. And they're scene setters, they're storytellers, they are dramatic and descriptive in how they write. It's almost as if they made it up, but they didn't make right. it up. Right. You and I had a conversation, now it has to be 10 years ago, about the way that you would hang out over time to get the story and get it right, whether it was with the Bonanno family whether or whether it was... Uh, uh, investigating, changing mores mm -hmm. in America in Thy Neighbor's Wife. Yeah. And I, over the years, I've been a great fan of Joan Didion, who I, whose nonfiction I admire very much. She used to say, and I think you said something similar, that she would just get there and she'd kind of be quiet and people would kind of forget she was there. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember you saying something similar. Sure. After you got famous... How is it possible for somebody who is now known as Gates Elise to hang out and not be noticed, especially in a three-piece suit? Did, did work get a little? Did work get a little harder after after well, you I, as I a writer became more well known? If Joan Didion was suggesting that she was sneaking around, no, no, not that. No, no, Just no. being quiet. Well, being quiet. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, it depends. There are times when you have to not ask a question. Uh huh. And you have to know when to let silence be part of your interaction with somebody and let them think for a long time in response maybe to an earlier asked question. Let them think it through. Mm -hmm. What I do, as you mentioned the word hanging out, I do that. What I like to do is go somewhere with the person that I'm interviewing. For example, I'll call up and I'll say, um, Mr. D uh, Professor Noble, Don Noble, uh, I have this piece to do 
And when do you think we can schedule? Oh, I'm busy. Professor Nobles at all. I'm busy. I have to. I have to go. Actually, I have to see my dentist at eleven o'clock. <laughs> then I have to go to see my pick my daughter at, at school. She's going to a soccer match. I said, Professor Noble, can I go with you to your dentist maybe while you're waiting? Well, I don't know. I'm going to feel well. I'll just, I won't. I won't say anything. Oh, all right. You can. I'll, okay. I see. So, so I'll go yeah. with him to you with you to the dentist. And then you, after you leave the dental office, you're feeling a little better. You have to go to, to you want to go buy a magazine, you go to, to, to the to the 911 store across the street. And I'll go with you there. Right. And then you'll get in your car, and I'm with you in the right. car. And then we go pick up your daughter. Your daughter is nine years old, and she's on a little soccer team for, for her grade school. I'll go with you to watch her. And then you're out there cheering. You're cheering, you're in the stands, cheering your daughter. Hey, Sally, blah, blah, blah. And over there, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm watching, I'm watching you, watching her. And you're not watching me, you're watching the game. Your uh -huh. daughter's, you know what I mean? All that could produce legitimately right. a situation in which you are actively involved, first with your dentist, then buying a magazine at the 7-Eleven, then driving over to the soccer field, then saying hello to the coach of the soccer team, whatever, and meeting some of your friends who are the parents of players, all that. That's a day in the life of Don Noble. You did what? this brilliantly with Joe DiMaggio. It's all, it's all, yeah. DiMaggio and Sinatra. And Sinatra. I, I didn't even talk to Sinatra, but I was watching him. So right. sometimes, you, sometimes you don't even have to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation as right. we are now. Right. Because sometimes, if it's a famous, famous, famous person, there's not something that they're going to say that hasn't been said because they've been interviewed a lot. And also, because they're famous and careful, they're not going to tell you anything because they're so educated in saying the wrong thing, because they probably bereaved, they were, they were, <laughs> they were ridiculed <laughs> by having done it once. So they're sure. cautious. Better you should just watch them do what they do. Right. If they're a singer, watch them sing or watch them rehearse. Right. Or, or, or watch them dress for rehearsal. It's, it's, that's interesting it's, stuff. In some of your pieces, you not only quietly go along with the subject and watch the subject, you watch the subject watching other people, and you watch other people watching the subject so that in the piece there'll be what somebody else had on his face watching Do Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> and you weren't even watching Joe. You were watching somebody watch Joe. Mm. And, 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 and it has worked. I have a couple more questions. Sports, has, sports writing has always been important to you. I mean, from the time you were in high school, in college, with your column, gazing, on yeah. and always, so there's something about the athlete that triggers the writer <clears throat> in you. You like to write about athletes, well, win or lose. I certainly do, but I'm in good company. So did Hemingway, Norman Mailer, George Plimpton. Why? Bud Schulberg. I mean, go on and on. Yeah. Because there is accessibility, number one. You can see them. Play. Uh -huh, you're uh -huh. on the stands, maybe you're uh -huh. next to them in a tennis court or a football field, on the sidelines, up in the press box at least. And then after the game is over, you go to the locker room. You can talk to them. Prize fighter was knocked out. You can actually ask him, did you see that punch coming? And maybe they're so groggy they can't answer, but whatever it is, they can give you some sense of what it was like to be in the ring a half hour before, before they got knocked out. And you saw that. Also, the experience, the public experience of humiliation isn't often what you have access to because if you're a reporter who covers crime or covers the war or covers the financial world, you don't actually see what's going on. I mean, if you cover the war, you don't actually see the, the, the attacks on, 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 on tanks or the drones flying here and there. You don't see in the financial world the back, the, 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 the back, back, back table dealings of financial t tycoons. And the It'd mergers. be worse than the Chinese restaurant kitchen. Oh. <laughs> but in, and even in politics, you might watch a speech during a campaign, yeah, but you know what yeah. canned stuff that yeah. is. Well, when you're covering sports, you're watching human emotion. You're watching human suffering. The, the person who loses sometimes in football as well as basketball. I mean, and as well as boxing, for sure, they're really physically the body contact of those games, yeah. and the and what it does to the body of the person who gets beat up a little bit, 
and then it sometimes terminates their career. So sometimes you see a 24-year-old or even a college-age person, all that they worked for when they were kids in little Pop Warner level sports, right. it's ruined. It's over. Alabama quarterback gets hit, and it's, he's a junior, and it's all over. And he, no NFL for him, nothing. And then they have to start at the age of 20, to graduate maybe. Now they have to have a career that isn't at all what they'd hoped. Right. They have to figure out a new way well, to what live. what a disappointment. Now, people right. in real life, certainly they lose their jobs, and they, get, they, get, they don't get promoted, and they're right. eased out, or they're bought out. People don't have to be famous or even athletic to know what it's like to lose. In fact, all of us know about losing. We, we lost the girl, we lost the job, we lost our money and some bad investment. And that's a lot of what our stories are now. But those stories can be written about. And the sports writing is like training for that. And so in sports writing, you deal with individuals. Granted, they have helmets on, but they take the helmets off and you see their faces. And, right. and you so see their stories. Makes an interesting apprenticeship then to other writings, as well yeah. as being uh, dramatic in itself. One more question, and, and, we're, <laughs> and we're out of time. You have been working on a book that's going to be factual and truth-telling, and it's going to be about marriage. Mm -hmm. It's true. How's it going, and, and, and isn't a, that still just as risky an endeavor as ever? Well, well it is risky <laughs> and, and adventurous as uh -huh, well, uh -huh. because it's nonfiction, as you said before. You said I use real names, and it's nothing imagined. There's nothing fabricated. When I, when I got married, even before I got married, I was married in 1959, I'm still married, the same person. But even before that, I was keeping records. I would, I, I, I somehow became a documentarian or a kind of private historian of myself and kept a record of where I was, who I saw, what I did day by day. It wasn't a diary form, but it almost like that, a journal. I kept information each day of what I did that day. I have calendars going back to 1945, believe it or not, uh -huh. when I was a high school uh, freshman. And, um, and I save clippings, I save letters, I save notes, and I file them. Not only do I save stuff, but I file it so that in a filing cabinet, I have numerous filing cabinets, as you might well imagine, I know where things are. I know what, how to find things. And in my marriage, which began with a two-year courtship before marriage, I kept all the notes and snapshots that somehow came to my possession, photographs, um, where I was, who I was with, when my wife and I were married and who was there, and then after we got back our first apartment, and after this and after that, and after the child's birth and all the jobs shifting back and forth. I have a written record of this. It's almost as if even though I didn't think about writing about marriage as a reporter's uh, quest, as a reporter's assignment, I was giving myself records and, and, and information in, in written form as a reminder and also as a, as a confirmation of the accuracy of my own recollections, my own memory. Well, you've been married a long time. It's, I've been a reporter for a long time, going, even longer. It's, it's going to be a long book. <laughs> Yeah, a chronicle, well, I, a chronicle I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to your New Yorker article, yeah. which will be coming out soon. I and so. altogether, this has been a pleasure once again. It is. Thank we'll you. Have very to do it again. We will do it again. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.